Hi, I am Dr. Jan Scarlett. Um, I am the founder of the shelter medicine program here at Cornell and served as its director for eight and a half years, but five years ago I retired. Uh, but as you know, when you're so passionate about something, it's really hard to walk completely away. So I now get to choose those things that I um, participate in. Um, I am also, by uh, training, a veterinary epidemiologist, and therefore my interest in data. Uh, I really love that there are so many of you in the audience. I always worry when I put data or metrics in the title that there will be two people or maybe nobody uh, in the audience. Uh, for some reason, some people are very put off by using data and, and afraid of numbers, and I, I think that there is so much that shelters could learn in addition to what they're doing uh, using their data. I also think it's an underutilized resource. How many of you have a computerized software program that you use? Anybody who does not? So all of you are using. Um, how many of you use it to generate things like a cage card or to help if somebody calls in and says, I'm, I've lost a um, small, white, um, uh, dachshund-looking dog. White, that's not right. Uh, 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 a poodle-looking dog. So you use it, yeah, yeah. How many of you do your annual reports and report intake and outcomes? Almost everybody. Okay, good. Um, how many of you are doing like average lengths of stay? on a routine basis. Good, so fewer of you, but, 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 but doing that. Um, how many of you are doing things like looking at your adoption rate? Good, good. So um, what I really am gonna talk about today is primarily using data at the aggregate level, not so much at the individual animal level although I strongly encourage you to look to use your data in that way. My sense of uh, traveling around and talking with shelters is that people spend a lot of time and therefore money on staff to enter data and only use a fraction of the data that they actually enter. And so my um, goal for the day is to really challenge you to make greater use of your data but to do so wisely. So we're going to talk not only about some examples of how you might use data, but also talk about uh, a specific example of do you know what you're looking at and do you know how best to interpret it? Okay. So I'm only going to talk about data that relates to animals. You could be looking at your capacity for parking in your parking lot, or you could be looking at your financial data. Today, I'm not talking about anything like that. I am talking about data that relates to the animals. Um, I'd like to share some what I think are influential metrics. You may already be using them, but I would certainly, I'm hoping I give you a little bit more information about them. Um, and I'd also, you know, in, in doing so, help you interpret it more um, accurately. And then I'm just going to mention Wisconsin um, Humane Society and Tampa Bay because people say to me, well, that all sounds wonderful, but is it really realistic? Can people really use their data to affect uh, improvements in animal welfare? And these happen to be two um, organizations. There are more than two, obviously. But they, these are two organizations that have really made some ground cha groundbreaking changes in their organization because they're using their data. Okay. So harnessing, this is a quote that comes from um, Steve McLaughlin, uh, Data Driven Nonprofits. And he says, harnessing the insights from data to drive decisions has the potential to transform the amount of change nonprofits can make in the world. Without data, decisions are left to tribal knowledge or worse, the whims of the highest paid person's opinion. And I've been in organizations certainly seeing that, where the most vocal and or the person with the most seniority dictates what will be done. And, and sometimes that's good. I mean, sometimes they are absolutely correct. But we have, as human beings, um, the propensity to 
sometimes see things through the ways we want to see them as opposed to the way they really are. And data can help keep us honest, if it's good data, of course. All right, so data should be useful. Why else, else why collect it? And I'm, I'm continuously surprised that software seems to concentrate, top software developers seem to concentrate on getting data in and don't give nearly the same amount of thought and um, investment in developing an e ease of way of getting data back out. Why do you want to put it in if you're not going to be able to get it out in a useful fashion? You can use data at two levels. The individual animal level, level that I mentioned earlier, the cage cards, things like that. I'm not going to talk about that. Rather, I'm going to concentrate at, at uh, looking at data at the population level. It can give you a sense, if you collect it over time, of where the, where the shelter has come from, uh, where it's heading, helping you to predict or to identify problem areas that you really want to address. The question of, are your programs working? Many, many shelters have spay and neuter programs. They're spay and neutering a lot of animals. Are they achieving your goal? Are you really, are you, are you seeing less animals coming into your shelters as a consequence? Should you be targeting your spay and neuter because blanketing is simply not working the way you want to? I mean, it's a, a feel-good exercise to neuter a lot of animals. But, and, it, and it helps those individual animals. But if part of your reason for doing neutering is to diminish the population of homeless animals, then is it working in that, in that, in that regard? So there's all kinds of reasons to use the data. I hope I can sh illustrate some of this, but certainly increasing insight. What are you really, what does your, prop, what do your populations look like? Where are your problems? Um, it can help measure progress, I'd say, in terms of evaluating whether your programs are working, uh, enhance communication between you and your staff, and incidentally, share your data not only with your boards of director and not only with the public, but by heaven's sakes, share it with your staff. They are the people who are your most amazing advocates. They should know. What is the character of the population coming in? They should know, not just what the live release rate is, but what, what, what are you doing in various subgroups of your animals? How are you doing with your foster care? Share that data. And in the shelters that I've worked with that are using their data, it is an incredible motivator for your staff to see that they are contributing to the progress that you're making. And you can use it as a rallying point for, hey, look what we've done. This year we had a, a last year we had a live release rate, or two years ago we had a live release rate of 75%. This year we have, we've jumped that to 82%. And you guys were part of the reason we were able to do that. If it wasn't for you, we couldn't, and I hear so many, we, we, we talk about, uh, oh, there's all this infighting and the staff is, you know, this and that, and you'll never take the human beings out of them, right? But on the other hand, if they have a common goal, if they can see that they're really uh, all working together towards a common goal, I think that can at least mitigate some of that, that um, angst that we sometimes find and that political intrigue that we find in the shelters. Build cooperation. Um, the Tampa Bay uh, SPCA now collects community-wide level uh, data, and they and now it wasn't an easy process. And those of you who might be interested in doing that in your own communities, I really would have you talk with the executive director there at Tom uh, at uh, Tampa Bay. She started by sharing her data by being open and say, and then she had to build in multiple meetings. But they now contribute data together that they then present publicly to their community. And the goal really, I, I start with shelters and I say start using your data in the shelter because you're going to need quality data. And you're not really going to get good quality data until people see it's useful. Otherwise it's just a, your data entry people are just doing something that you've required of them but they don't understand the value or they may not understand the value of that data. Um, but uh, it, 
ultimately we can get good quality data within our shelters, then we can combine that data and start looking at the community level problems. Um, and then it, more and more we're going to see requests for data with grant writing. People, our, our groups are going to start saying, you know, what are we getting for our, the money we're investing? Are you making progress? Yes, you're doing all these spay neuters, or yes, you're doing this TNR program, but are we making progress in that community? Is that money well spent for us? Enough said. Okay. So, what metrics? I'm probably preaching to the to the uh, converted. That's why you're here, you know. But <laughs> I apologize. I'm I am very um, excited and uh, committed to this, and so uh, I just want to. And maybe I'm giving you some arguments for your making changes in your own shelters if you don't. Have it. All right. I think there's some consensus building that we should be looking at basic intake outcome. How many of you commit are, are participants in the shelter animal count SAC? Good. For those of you who aren't, I would encourage you to really think about that. How many of you who are doing SAC though have gotten on their website and started to play with the data that you have for your place or, or otherwise? I don't know. I don't know. We don't utilize it. Yeah, you really, I, I, I encourage, I know in all your spare time, right? But, <laughs> but, you know, on weekends or whatever, sit down and devote even a half hour. Because, again, why put the data in if you're not going to take advantage of their ability now to start graphing things for you to really look at that data in a, in a way that was in addition to what you just entered in a tabular form? Okay. Well, I also think that point is not as easily transferred as they'd like you to believe it is. So we have difficulty oh. sometimes. Yeah. And they'll say, oh, you just run this report, and it'll pop it right in, and then you put it in, it says zero, zero. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and so one of the, so the comment down here was that the software doesn't always enable that transfer in nearly as easily as they had hoped. And, and certainly one of the impediments is to all of what I'm going to talk about is the software and its, uh, and its difficulties associated with uh, things like transferring data, things like retrieving data. Um, Another metric, I think average length of stay, look, many of you or almost all of you are losing average length of stay, and then some measure of live release. I think there's some consensus. I often get asked, what, what other data should I be collecting? Or what other, what other questions should I be looking at? And my answer to that is, what do you want to know? <laughs> and they look at me and they go, I don't know what I want to know, uh, or I'd be doing it, right? Um, ally your questions. And your questions will dictate what you look at in your data. Ally them to your objectives and to your goals. And uh, so objectives, in, in a broad sense, are just those um, overarching accomplishments that you want to achieve with regards to your mission. They got to be allied to your mission. But your goals are very specific, actionable steps that get you to your objectives, that then get you to your mission. And so um, these goals need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bounded. And incidentally, if you want more about, if you just type in um, SMART goals, you'll get a whole host of things online. I don't have time today to really talk about it. But I want to talk, the um, reason I'm mentioning this is that the, the measurable part, right? Um, and without goals, and, and most shelters have goals, almost all shelters have goals. They have fundraising goals, they have maybe capital campa campaign goals, they have hiring goals. But what other kinds of goals in terms of your mission do you have? And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, I'll give you some ideas. All right, so what do you need or want to know? The way I think about it is that with regards to the animals, we have issues that surround intake. We have issues that surround and objectives that surround once we get animals in the shelter, what we want to achieve there. And then we have outcomes or, or um, objectives that surround outcomes. So for example, one very common objective in shelters is to reduce intake from the community, right? I mean, may, we may have transfer programs, but in our own community, we are hoping that we can diminish intake. Uh, so what do we have? We have spay-neuter programs. We have TNR programs. In some cases, we have subsidized veterinary care. All right, 
What are your what are your goals now specifically for each of these programs? Uh, similarly, for if if when they're in our shelter, we want to provide for the very best welfare we possibly can. How do we do that? Uh, prompt vaccination, enrichment programs to diminish stress, daily rounds. What are those are our broad objectives, and each of those then have goals and plans for how do we get to that objective. Okay, so I'm trying to get you to kind of systematically think about this, and so on top of localizing your questions and breaking them down into intake within the shelter and outcomes, the question is, I call, sort of call them the, the four W's. What is happening? For example, are our illness rates going down? Is our, is our rates of upper respiratory tract disease falling? Is our average length of stay diminishing, or heaven forbid, it's going up? Uh, do we have behavioral problems? Are they increasing, or are we, do we have effective programs that are really reducing them? Who is involved? Is it just kittens that are getting sick? Um, are we making progress with puppies coming into our shelters? And many of us in the Northeast are, in fact, looking for puppies. Uh, but how are we doing with kittens? Um, when did, and so that's who's involved. When does it occur? What's the, monthly, what's the seasonal distribution of intake? Um, how does it vary by subgroup, by age group, by source? And where does it take place? And it could be within the shelter, or if you're looking at programs that are aimed at diminishing uh, intake, are there certain communities, certain areas in our catchment area that are contributing disproportionately to intake? Uh, do we know what those areas are? Because you're gonna have to know them before you can really target and, and get the most efficient use of your resources in attacking that. Okay, so number one, you gotta know the questions. And, you gotta, and we'll look at some other questions here so to give you some better ideas of what I mean by goals. But the step, step two is you gotta know something about your database and the architecture of the way the data are put in. Very often now, since the software programs have been around a while, the people that set up the architecture of the data are no longer with the organization. Or they don't remember why they had a particular definition associated with it and why we happen to have that particular um, uh, uh, opportunity or field to enter data. So in PetPoint, these are fixed. So you need to decide what are service in, what are clinic in, how are you going to use those particular. And, and you must have them defined somewhere. And that when you're training people on intake, they need to know what you want there. And unfortunately, like I say, in a lot of cases, these were set up before people really thought about what they wanted in any detail. So if that's the case in your shelter, go back and change it now. Make a note of when you made the change, because if you start looking at data over time, you want to know this is when we made the change, but now is the time to change it. Don't just say, well, we've always done it this way, therefore I'm going to continue to do it this way. All right, so those are fixed. In PetPoint, and in all of the software pack, I'm using PetPoint not, not to promote PetPoint, but because most of our data in this area come from PetPoint. Um, when you look at subcategories in intake and outcome, you get, to, you get to define those. You get to say, okay, under owner, guardian, surrender, what subtypes do I want to look at? Do I want to look at surrendered by owner, born in care, uh, dead on arrival? And, and you can make, I, I've seen lists of 15 different things there. And my question is, how are you going to use those? Why are, you, why are you dividing them into 15 different categories that now the intake, poor intake person's got to go all the way down through them and figure out where they're going to put the data? Uh, and, and if they don't even understand why you're doing it, because you don't understand why you're doing it, then why, why not shorten that up and say, how am I going to use this? This, this is going to require some time to sit down and really say, is this the structure we want in our data? Because this is what we want to do with it. Okay. Um, 
And be sure that you have definitions with those, those, those different categories so that people know what is. For example, um, a, um, a returned adoption. What's a returned adoption in your facility? Is it an animal that was adopted seven years ago? That's a returned adoption? Or is it the one that was adopted uh, two weeks ago or a month ago? And why do you have that definition? What are you interested in? Are you interested in we're not making, you know, we're having a problem making matches and maybe we could improve that? Are we just interested in we want to see how many animals come back to us? Why do you want to know that information? And then put a definition on it that's consistent with how you want to use it and how you want to monitor it. Okay? Uh, make sure your categories are all inclusive but mutually exclusive. The, these animals, this, this category has animals from 5 to 7, 7 to 9, 9 to, to 12. Where does the input person put the 7 year old? In the 2 to 7 or the 7 to 9? I mean, yes, there's, there, it's not perfect. We don't know age perfectly. But it makes it even less perfect when you um, have overlapping categories. Okay? And then, again, I, I just I, I tie what you collect in your definitions and all to what, how you think you want to use it. Think about how you think you want to use that data. Um, you know, sometimes we put data in just to put data in, everything but the kitchen sink, and we don't even use most of it. So think about what you want to collect and then how you're going to use it. And, and start with how you're going to use it, and then you, and then you can and put, it, put it in. Um, start looking at your data. Just jump in and start looking at your data. Um, you can say, oh, it's not perfect, it's not right. It's not. You're only going to improve it and, and be invested in it if you start using it. Uh, all the little warts start popping up. We've got 20% missing information. Now I've got to go back to my, to my staff and say, hey, let's, get, let's step up to the plate. We're going to start using this data, and I don't want 20%. Often those that are missing, you don't know why. Are they different from the ones that got entered? And so you want to get as complete an information as possible. You'll never have perfect information. I'm not advocating for perfect because it isn't a, a realistic goal. But you want as good an information as you possibly can get. Okay? Uh, start looking at that data. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about intake metrics. Y you know that there are all kinds of ways that you can look at and in in use intake data. Uh, again, the four W's who's entering, where are they coming from, when are they entering, and what's happening with them. All right, this is, a, this is just sort of an overall look at general basic intake data, just to get a sense of what's the characteristics of the animals coming into my shelter. And I'm amazed at times at how many sh shelters really don't have a good sense of, well, what's the age distribution of our animals? Um, I mean, in most shelters in the Northeast, you're going to have many more kittens than puppies. But in this case, it's almost twice as many kittens as puppies. Um, what does that mean? I'm going to have to manage kittens, their health and what have you. I'm also thinking about, well, uh, this, is, this is the proportion that's coming in. Now, can I diminish that? Can I change that distribution? If I start doing spay neuter and effective TNR programs, I should see a, uh, an effect in the kittens, right? I should be, see them start to drop. Uh, so it's not only for, for um, planning purposes as to who I'm going to have to care for, but also it's a baseline for looking at, OK, are my programs working or not? Um, who am I going to have to care for? Uh, again, a difference in the two to seven in the, uh, between dogs and cats. Do you know the character of your animals? Can you speak to it with your staff? Do they kind of understand what the character of their animals is? For those of you who have animal control contracts, if you're getting a disproportionately large number of animals from a particular town or county or whatever, whatever area you're in, you ought to be charging that town or county more money for their animal control. And a lot of, of shelters I've been in, they charge a, a flat rate across. But you know, if you're handling a lot more animals, nothing like getting their, their attention in that community to, uh, to uh, 
caring about the control of their animals by saying, look, you're going to have to pay more because we're getting a lot more animals. Plus, it gives you a target, right? It gives you, boy, this town is where I'm going to start investing more attention because this town is disproportionately bringing in a lot of animals. Okay. Uh, trends, obviously, here's a shelter that happened to have data way back to 97. Uh, they don't, I only have it up to 2011 now, but can you see there's really not much progress, at least up to 2011 in cats. They, and this is a northeast shelter, it's probably not surprising. Probably a lot of your shelters are looking like this. Incidentally, what's true in, my, in, in this shelter may not be true in other shelters. I mean, it, it's really what's happening in your shelter. That's what's important, is what's happening in your shelter. That's why you need to look at it, okay? Uh, again, all this kitten mountain, all of you know that um, we're seeing more, you know, we've got this huge kit influx of kittens. But you know what, it should be, there, your kittens should be going down, right? I mean, hopefully, each year, your peak is, I hate this, these, these things are not great. Uh, anyway, it should be, there should be a trend down, right? And unfortunately or unfortunately, the adult cats remain fairly stable, and we found that uh, in, other, in many other communities. And again, you know, kind of a radically different pre uh, presentation for dogs, at least here in the Northeast or in, the, in this particular shelter. Okay. All right. So then just, again, talking, uh, I, I can't stress enough looking at are your programs achieving what you want them to achieve, right? So if you're in a community where you have spay neuter, where you have TNR, um, the objective with those programs, at least partially, not only to improve the individual animal health, but is hopefully to bring down the numbers that are coming into your shelter from that community. And so um, what's your plan for doing that? Are you using the best approach to get the most, of, the most response, that is reducing you know, your animals most effectively for the money that you're spending doing it? Um, and then so what, what metrics could you measure to try to help you? It's not going to be perfect, but what, can you what metrics can you measure that could help you understand that? So what could, you, what could you monitor? Well, obviously, decreased cat intake, right? I mean, hopefully the cats go down. But probably, cats are not, first of all, these programs take time to work. They take time to work, so don't expect you start a program or you, you want to see what's happening over time, so you need trend data. But the kittens should go down first, because you're spaying and or neutering the, those that, that are producing the kittens. So looking at kitten intake separate from cat intake overall without regard to age. Um, you should, as, as your programs, if they're hitting where you want them to hit in those cats that are most likely to reproduce, you should begin to see a higher group, a higher proportion of cats coming in that have already been neutered. If you're not, then why not? And, can, and, and then you have to strategize, right? You have to strategize. How can we address that? Um, and then increasing, you should you know, over time, we should see an elevation in the age of the populations and a diminishment of the, because we're not adding new young kittens to the population. So here's just some ideas for you. They're not perfect, but they help you to decide whether you're, you're really making an effect. And maybe, uh, and so here's a shelter where, and this is, it, this is kind of, in a, in a, in a, yeah, this is quite, it raises a question in my mind. I was trying to say, in a, in a, in a, in a, I can't say it. <laughs> anyway, um, here's a, a, a population that is seeing a decline in cats under two months of age, but their three to six months is, is remaining fairly constant. And I haven't, you know, these often raise questions that you may not know the answers to. I don't, I don't know why exactly this has happened. I even looked at the rates in this, and in fact, the rates are going down. It's not just a reflection of uh, a changing population. The rates are going down. Um, why that is, I mean, on one hand, I'm happy to see that the, uh, the young, youngest of our kittens are going down, but why aren't our three to six months old? So, all right. So if you're not happy, if things aren't really happening the way you want, then potentially looking for data that can help you target. And I've already alluded to that and started to allude to that. Um, many shelters use zip codes. In these particular zip codes, we are seeing uh, a disproportionate number 
of animals coming in. And unfortunately, zip codes may help you in some cases, and in some cases they won't because the zip codes are so broad that they cover so many communities that you can't really begin to zero in. Um, I mentioned uh, geographic information systems. They are becoming more common. Um, these, what they are, are the, they enable you to geographically locate, well, I'll, let me show you something. This, this, is, this was done here in Tompkins County. Uh, you can geographically locate where, in this case, intake of um, kittens. We geographically located where the, vet, the numbers of kittens came from in the county. And by doing so, for example, we identified a couple of um, trailer parks that had a disproportionate um, intake, we're getting a disproportionate intake of kittens from them. And able then to get a grant to go and do a, a door to door, literally, we'll, we will come to you, we will pick up your cats, we will take you, take them back to the, the shelter and get them neutered. Um, GIS is becoming more available, I mean, first of all, there's some freeware, and, and actually Dr. Greenberg has used it, and, and it's not, it's not as, perhaps, the freeware is not as good as some of the really, Mike, you want to comment on it? So, um, yeah, yeah, sure. No, because I think this is important. That yeah, so um, the GIS stuff has gotten so much uh, more accessible. And around the time we did this, it was a matter of going to a university or, you know, uh, a government entity and saying, hey, can you help me out with this? Or if you just had somebody who was maybe in your shelter and good at it. Now, I think the best two ways to go about this are, and I, I use this, uh, all the time. Google My Maps. If you go to the you know Google My Maps, um, it's it's a sort of a component of Google Maps. You can upload a data set, and whereas you used to have to get things geocoded, um, kind of feed them through this other black box, uh, and have them geocoded. Now, not surprisingly, you just tell Google Maps here are the columns that have addresses in them, and there you go. If you want to go one step deeper than that in terms of visualization, you can use Google. I'm, I don't work for Google. <laughs> um, you can use what's called Fusion Tables. And Fusion Tables are just, uh, and it's another Google product, free. Uh, they're a little bit more sophisticated and enable you to do things like make a, uh, you all familiar with like a heat map, or you know, make things like a heat map, change the, um, the look of it, which would be helpful. And then the third, uh, sort of level of generally freely available sophistication. Yeah, you know, get, this gets quite a bit more sophisticated. It's called Esri Tools. E S R I. Esri is, is a you know giant you know, GIS software company. They have some enterprise stuff. It's uh, very expensive, very sophisticated. But they have tools available for nonprofits, and it goes beyond mapping. You can. You would pretty easily build little apps and things like that that are helpful for data collection and build. Uh, if you ever want to go down a rabbit hole, look up story maps, and you'll be like, "Oh my gosh, I want to build a story map." I'll leave it at that. But, um, <laughs> map stuff. Mike, cool. Mike, you'll be around afterwards. Maybe yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. ask you some additional questions. Um, just this is the epidemiologist in me. Be be also careful when you're looking at data that there may be some other explanations. So you're seeing, for example, uh, a decrease in intake of dogs in your shelter, and you go, oh, wow, we're doing a really great job. And in fact, there are two new uh, rescue groups in the area that are helping to siphon off animals from there. So just be mindful. When you look at data, you have to interpret it wisely, right? Um, I want to talk a little bit about shelter metrics within the shelter. Uh, obviously, overcrowding has a lot of deleterious effects. Um, and when your intake exceeds your outflow, you're going to get uh, accumulation of animals. And very often, you get declines in adherence to protocols, disease rates rise, isolation facilities are overwhelmed, length of stay goes up, et cetera. Um, and there are lots of ways to, and then there are lots of, lots of information out there about how to deal 
with overcrowding in our shelters. The two I want to talk about are managed intake and reducing time in the shelter because those are things that we can, um, in fact, uh, use data to help us achieve. Um, one of the things I think one of the easiest things I th you can do, easy quote unquote, is to look at um, two metrics. One is your estimated number of animals that you can house comfortably at any one point in time, and then the average daily inventory, how many animals you actually have. And the whole idea being, of course, that you want to have your inventory within your capacity to house. And so looking at, it doesn't have to be perfect, because obviously four kittens can fit in the cage that you could house one adult cat. So you're going to have, if you have kitten housing separate from adult housing, then you can do it for each area. If you mix the two, then you're just going to have to estimate what roughly in this particular holding area, how many kittens can I, can I, can I house? Suggestions for, we have a lot of free roaming rooms. We actually don't keep them. Free roaming rooms. And, and that's, a, that's another, there are guidelines in the veterinary guidelines uh, for shelters that I'm, I'm not going to go into today, but uh, there are guidelines for, for multi-use or for multiple animal rooms. Uh, but just getting some estimates. Oh, the question, <laughs> the question was what happens, how do you estimate for uh, multi-cat households? And I said there are multi-cat rooms. Uh, and I said that you could go ahead to the veterinary guidelines, okay, shelter guidelines. Um, so it's the number of animals you can house at any one point in time. So how many of you do that? How many of you have a sense of, especially by room, what is your capacity? And, and for those of you who don't, it's not a really hard exercise. And again, you can be comfortable with a range. It's not going to be perfect. Go ahead and do that. Because then, if you do your inventories, especially by location in the shelter, the number of anim the, the, the number that you should be housing compared to the number you have, w one should not be, the, uh, the number that you have should not be larger than the number that you can house. And so that's one way, very kind of um, simple way of kind of checking today. Geez, we're way, now it doesn't, you're not going to have perfect all the time. It's going to vary, right? It's the chronic overcrowding that is the problem. And then also, if there are particular areas in your shelter that are almost always overcrowded, even though the whole shelter itself is not overcrowded. So that's one suggestion for you. Um, the other thing that many shelters have done, and this in particular Ann Reed at Wisconsin Humane, has used um, these three metrics to help her estimate and set some goals for her staff. So um, knowing the number that you can house, that is those humane, I'm calling them humane because we don't want these small two by two cages to be um, the sheltering for cats that are gonna remain in there longer than they might be just there for recovery or whatever. We don't wanna use that. So don't, don't count those. They, they, aren't, they go off the table as humane housing units. Uh, the time that animals usually spend, the average length of stay, like you were we were talking about before, and then intake and outflow. So here's a, uh, people go, oh no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, an equation. This is a very simple equation, okay? And it's a guideline for you. Um, you know, if you've done your exercise on what your capacity, what your um, estimated number of animals per room is, or in the shelter itself, you know the humane number of humane housing units you have available. And you may, if you've got a range, pick a number within the range, maybe the middle of the range. You can figure out for a time period how many days are in that time period, and then you can get your average length of stay from the software. And that'll help you decide how many new animals you can house in a period of time. I'm going to show you an example so that maybe this will make it a little bit clearer. If you divide both of those, uh, both sides of that equation by um, the number of days in the period, you can estimate how many animals you can bring in and how many animals need to go every day. So if you're doing managed intake, you have a, an estimate of how many animals you should be receiving uh, and, and leaving each day. It gives you some guidelines to do your managed intake. 
So here's an example. Let's say that this is a shelter that has 50 humane housing units for cat, let's say adult cats. They want to uh, estimate how many animals they can house between July and September. So that's 92 days. I've just added up the number of days in each of the months. And their average length of stay is 20 days in that shelter for those cats. For those, and remember, this average length of stay now should be specific for the group of cats that you're looking at or the group of animals that you're looking at. If you're looking at kittens, then use their average length of stay. Okay? So in this case, if I run through the numbers, 230 cats should come in, or roughly two, we should be admitting roughly two to three animals a day. Now, sometimes you're closed on a, on a one day out of the week, so you're going to have to adjust that. It may be a little bit higher uh, or a little bit uh, higher or lower, depending on if you've got days where you're not actually receiving uh, owner surrenders or if there are days when you're receiving um, stray animals all throughout the week but not owner surrenders all throughout the week. But, but these, these are estimates. They're not magic numbers that are engraved in stone. They're estimates, guidelines to help you. All right, so now we'd reduce that 20 days to 14 days. Same shelter, same time frame. We go from 230 cats that you could accept down to, uh, or up to 328 cat, 28 cats that you could accept. And again, these, these are numbers that are estimates. But, they're, but that's a sizable difference between 230 and 328. And now you, should, you could be admitting and moving out roughly three to four animals a day. So you've increased your capacity to bring animals in and, and get them through. Um, you don't have to do that, that. You could program that in Excel, for example. But you could just create a chart. All right, we're starting at 20. If we reduce it to 18. Now I can manage this number of animals, and I can take in, and again, roughly three cats a day. Uh, so that you can create your own little chart and use that as a goal. And what Anne has done is she's used this to set up guidelines for what, she, what, what, what her target average lengths of stay are, and then, and then kind of made a competition in the, in the group. Can we get to, if we get to, uh, you know, if we reduce it from 20 down to 16, we're going to have a big party. We're all going to go out to dinner. She's using that as a motivating uh, factor to get her staff to buy into their, their, they're the ones that are going to achieve that re reduction in average length of stay. Um, also, uh, Dr. Greenberg has developed a capacity uh, uh, calculator that now exists at Maddie's Fund on their website, and I think also Corette still has a, uh, a capacity, so you don't have to do this all by hand if you don't want to. And you can make it more sophisticated than what I have here uh, by saying, well, I want to do kittens only, or I want to do cats only, or whatever, okay? So just beware. There's, there's some assumptions associated with this. Again, this is the epidemiologist that has to talk to you about this. But remember, if, you're, if your intake doesn't in, uh, equal outflow, let's say most of your cats come in at the beginning of an interval, then you're probably going to be overcrowded even though you're using this formula, right? Because, and then you'll be, you'll be underutilizing your space at the latter part. Um, this is a shelter where they looked at what their current intake was by day of the week just to get a sense of what was their intake. So if they're going to managed care, they have some sense of, all right, where are we going to have to make adjustments? Where, where do we want to start scheduling people to, bring, to have them bring their animals in? And how are we going to adjust that? So, and then you could look at it afterwards to see whether you've kind of either, at least evened it out or, you've, or you are um, accounting for the space in your shelter as you bring them in. Okay, so I, just a couple of things. All of you are, our length of stay is usually the, from the date an animal comes in to the date it leaves. So usually you take date of exit, final outcome, minus date of intake, and you get a number. The animal was there 16 days, okay? Um, and it's important for, because we know the disease and behavioral problems are very much tied to that. And we want to make the most efficient use of our, of our cage space. Um, movement, average length of stay is now we just take the average, right? We take all the, the lengths of stay, add them up for the period we're interested in, divide it by the number of animals that we had, and we get the average length of stay. It's just a normal, regular average, right? And it's important 
because now not only for individual animal health but also because of the number of animals that we can house and the cost of animals per animal cost for housing animals the longer they stay the more it costs us to keep them there all right so whole goal is to minimize uh, average length of stay and you have strategies for which for which you you used to do that right daily rounds uh, monitoring what is happening, um, being sure that animals are moving along. You don't have bottlenecks. You have sufficient veterinarians to do the spay neuter so that they're not bottlenecked and waiting for the veterinarian to come in twice a week or whatever. Okay. Um, but I want to just caution you. First of all, averages can mask what's happening within. Uh, so if you're looking at all animals, the average length of stay, you could have specific groups that are having the longest length of stay, certain age groups. Oftentimes our older animals, for example, are staying longer than our younger animals. And that's not necessarily, that's, that's, that's not bad, it's just then you can strategize how could we increase. Is there, is there any way to increase average length of stay of our older animals and still preserve the, our mission? Um, these are the subgroups that I like to, I like to use. Um, in particular, when I'm looking at data, I start with the overall and then look at different subgroups. Um, so let's look. We can look at uh, average length of stay by season. It's often different by season, at least in the shelters I've looked at. That's why I don't like overall average length of stay, because it's masking what's really happening within. Um, it's a good pl starting place overall, but I really like to start breaking it down to see when and, and is there anything I can do about these average lengths of stay? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you just have to live with it. But you're looking for places that you can make progress. OK. Uh, here is average length of stay by age group. I, I very frequently remove from my average length of stay calculations the, the youngest animals I have in foster care. Because these are going to pull your average up. And these are animals that you don't want to shorten their length of stay there. They're there staying in eight weeks or whatever your cutoff is for their welfare. So pulling them out to me makes lots of sense and looking at them separately from the other animals where I may be able to really affect change. Um, again, if you have lots of these really neonatal animals, then um, you're going to weight that and, and, and bias your average length of stay upwards. And you may be doing a wonderful job with the other age groups. Um, you can also look at not just average length of stay, but time to certain events. What's the average time to get for an animal to get to the adoption floor? Again, looking for bottlenecks. What's keeping animals from getting to the adoption floor? Is it a hang up with um, spay neuter? Are we backlogged with spay neuter? Do we need to bring on another veterinarian or um, somehow look at our flow with that? that? Those are questions that I think this can help you target. OK. So all right, we know what, uh, how to do an average length of stay. This is from PetPoint. PetPoint asks you, do you want to do intake or outcome average length of stay? What does that mean? I just said, what does that mean? Um, how, many, how many of you use pet point? All right, what, what do you use? When you do your average length of stay, do you choose intake or outcome? Outcome, outcome. outcome? okay. Um, do you know why? <laughs> okay. So intake date means uh, it's the average length of stay among animals entering during a particular interval. So you say, I want to do the average length of stay from, uh, for the summer, from July through September. July, August, September, yeah. July, July through September, OK? It looks at the intake only for animals that came in in that, or the average length of stay only for animals that came in during that period. Outcome does the opposite. That is, it looks at only animals that left during that interval. What was their average length of stay? Um, there's another way of calculating it. it. It's available in Shelter Love. It may be coming up in other, in other where it's actually care day. It says, of the animals that were there during the summer, how many, what was their average length of stay? 
regardless of when they came in or regardless of when they left. So let's look very quickly uh, at an example. Let's just, this is really simple-minded, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get through everything because we kind of stopped, but that's okay. Um, let's say there's four dogs in a rescue. I made this really easy because I wanted to keep the numbers really small, and I wanted to show you. So each of these, so for dog number one, it came in in late May and left you know, within a week or so in June. So do you understand what the, the schematic shows? Okay, so dog number one stayed 20 days, uh, dog number two stayed 10, etc. What's the average, what's the, these, are the, these give you the lengths of stay, all right? Um, if I do an average length of stay based on intake, then I'm only going to look at dog number two and dog number three. They came in during that interval, and this is how long they stayed in the shelter, regardless of when they left. They could have left in June, but they could have left in September. Okay? So in this case, 95 is the average length of stay. If I do outcome, then I'm only going to look at the animals that left during that interval. And regardless of when they came in, that's their, in, their average length of stay. If I wanted to do capacity, and use that formula, I, I want to know what's the average length of stay during June. That is, regardless of when they came in or left, I want to know how long were they there, because they were occupy, occupying space in that month, right? They were the ones that were there in that month. If I do capacity based on animals on intake only, I've, I still could have animals that came in before the beginning of that interval. So it's if you're going to do capacity, it's really advisable to try to look at average length of stay on the care day based. Um, and since I'm running out of time, I want to make a little plug because we, Mike and uh, Dr. Hoshizaki and I wrote a book, and we have some suggestions on how you might get uh, care day based average length of stay uh, using the data you have. And I know Shelter Love is now calculating it for you, and we're kind of pushing and hoping that the others will as well. So which one to use? Well, if you do average length of stay on an annual basis, they all sort of converge, right? Because most of the animals have been there, most of them have entered during that time frame, and most of them have left during that time frame. So they all get very similar for an annual average length of stay. That said, I don't like the whole year because, again, it often varies average length of stay may vary by season. And so you're now using a, an estimate that doesn't pertain to any particular season. It's just the average. So um, if, you're, if you're just monitoring your average length of stay, and especially if you're doing it at least at the seasonal level, then I think probably just choose one. Just don't mix them. <laughs> if you're just wanting to see, does it going up or down, then stick with it intake based or outcome based. If you're doing it by month, I would say go to outcome based because intake, they haven't had a chance yet to have a final um, disposition. You're going to bias because you're going to bias it downwards because they haven't yet had a chance if you're going for shorter periods of time. Um, and then if you're doing it for capacity, I really say that you really should strongly consider, because I don't like capacity for a whole year for the reasons that, that um, you don't have an average length of stay that is consistent across that time. I'd really have you do it for a shorter period of time. Um, and, then, and then, of course, oh, so, uh, so I'm going to stop there. Um, also, I wanted to say that if you wanted to contact me, I am retired, but I love questions about data. And so really, if you wanted to contact me, I would love you to do that. Yeah. Thank you.